master. The dragon is coming, or I am a fool, he cried. Cut the bridges, to arms, to arms. Then warning trumpets were suddenly sounded and echoed along the rocky shores. The cheering stopped and the joy was turned to dread. So it was that the dragon did not find them quite unprepared. Before long, so great was his speed, they could see him as a spark of fire rushing towards them and growing ever huger and more bright, and not the most foolish doubted that the prophecies had gone rather wrong. Still, they had a little time. Every vessel in the town was filled with water, every warrior was armed, every arrow and dart was ready, and the bridge to the land was thrown down and destroyed, before the roar of Smaug's terrible approach grew loud, and the lake rippled red as fire beneath the awful beating of his wings. Amid shrieks and wailing and the shouts of men, he came over them, swept towards the bridge, and was foiled. The bridge was gone, and his enemies were on an island in deep water, too deep and dark and cool for his liking. If he plunged into it, a vapour and a steam would arise, enough to cover all the land with a mist for days. But the lake was mightier than he. It would quench him before he could pass through. Roaring, he swept back over the town. A hail of dark arrows leapt up and snapped and rattled on his scales and jewels, and the shafts fell back, kindled by his breath, burning and hissing into the lake. No fireworks you ever imagined equaled the sights of that night. At the twanging of the bows and the shrilling of the trumpets, the dragon's wrath blazed to its height, till he was blind and mad with it. No one had dared to give battle to him for many an age, nor would they have dared now if it had not been for the grim-voiced man. Bard was his name, who ran to and fro, cheering on the archers and urging the master to order them to fight to the last arrow. Fire leapt from the dragon's jaws. He circled for a while high in the air above them, lighting all the lake. The trees by the shores shone like copper and like blood with leaping shadows of dense black at their feet. Then down he swooped straight through the arrow storm, reckless in his rage, taking no heed to turn his scaly sides towards his foes, seeking only to set their town ablaze. Fire leapt from thatched roofs and wooden beam ends as he hurtled down and passed and round again, though all had been drenched with water before he came. Once more water was flung by a hundred hands wherever a spark appeared. Back swirled the dragon. A sweep of his tail and the roof of the great house crumbled and smashed down. Flames unquenchable sprang high into the night. Another swoop, and another, and another house, and then another sprang afire and fell. And still no arrow hindered Smaug or hurt him more than a fly from the marshes. Already men were jumping into the water on every side. Women and children were being huddled into laden boats in the market pool. Weapons were flung down. There was mourning and weeping, where but a little time ago the old songs of mirth had come, uh, to come had been sung about the dwarves. Now men cursed their names. The master himself was turning to his great gilded boat, hoping to row away in the confusion and save himself. Soon all the town would be deserted and burned down to the surface of the lake. That was the dragon's hope. They could all get into boats for all he cared. There he could have fine sport hunting them, or they could stop until they starved, let them try to get to land and he would be ready. Soon he would set all the shoreland woods ablaze and wither every field and pasture. Just now he was enjoying the sport of town baiting more than he had enjoyed anything for years. But there was still a company of archers that held their ground among the burning houses. Their captain was Bard, grim-voiced and grim-faced, whose friends had accused him of prophesying floods and poisoned fish. Though they knew his worth and courage, he was a descendant in long line of Girion, Lord of Dale, whose wife and child had escaped down the running river from the ruin long ago. Now he shot with a great yew bow, till all his arrows but one were spent. The flames were near him. His companions were leaving him. He bent his bow for the last time. Suddenly, out of the dark, something fluttered to his shoulder. He started, but it was only an old thrush. Unafraid, it perched by his ear, and it brought him news. Marvelling, he found he could understand its tongue, 
for he was of the race of Dale. Wait, wait, it said to him. The moon is rising. Look for the hollow of the left breast as he flies and turns above you. And while Bard paused in wonder, it told him of tidings up in the mountain and of all that it had heard. Then Bard drew his bowstring to his ear. The dragon was circling back, flying low, and as he came, the moon rose above the eastern shore and silvered his great wings. Arrow, said the bowman. Black Arrow, I have saved you to the last. You have never failed me, and I always have recovered you. I had you from my father, and he from of old. If ever you came from the forges of the true king under the mountain, go now and speed well. The dragon swooped once more lower than ever, and as he turned and dived down, his belly glittered white with sparkling fires of gems in the moon. But not in one place. The great bow twanged, the black arrow sped straight from the string, straight for the hollow by the left breast where the foreleg was flung wide. In it smote and vanished, barb, shaft and feather, so fierce was its flight. With a shriek that deafened men, felled trees and split stone, Smaug shot spouting into the air, turned over and crashed down from on high in ruin. Full on the town he fell, his last throes splintered it to sparks and gleeds. The lake roared in, a vast steam leapt up, white in the sudden dark under the moon. There was a hiss, a gushing whirl, and then silence. <laughs>